a uh, very good morning to all uh, a doctor can bury his mistakes but an architect can only advise his clients to plant vines truly a hilarious and a relevant quote by the legendary architect frank lloyd wright good morning everyone i am himani sarvaya assistant manager at animation express your host for today and welcome you to the second day of architecture design and more summit 2021 where we will be focusing on our theme designing the new world order the virtual summit organized by animationexpress.com which is spearheaded by its founder mr anil vanwari the summit is curated by architect apurva bose tata who is an indian author award winning architectural journalist curator and editor with 16 plus years of global collaborations in the aec industry next up it is a pleasure to honor uh, and an honor to invite nathalie devrise founding partner mvrdv rotterdam netherlands uh, to deliver the keynote session uh, she's uh, so uh, she's here and uh, as the dv and mvrd uh, we founding partner natri devrice has led many successful uh, mvrdv projects with a focus on the invention of new building typologies and the creation of changeable open systems uh, devrice combines her work for mvrdv with a position as professor of architectural design and public building at the faculty of architecture at tu delft the central theme in her research uh, 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 research design and construction of public buildings and uh, public space is multiplicity in design and in 2021 the municipality of groning uh, groningen uh, appointed devrice to the position of city architect in this role uh, devrice uh, advises on current urban design and architectural projects and brings spatial uh, issues to the floor uh, in order to improve the city's physical living environment and building culture uh, the topic is going to be mvrdv uh, triple d's data uh, density and diversity welcome uh, natalie uh, to to our summit and over to you we're looking forward to a wonderful session ahead thank you for this wonderful uh, enthusiastic uh, introduction uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you all today and i've been listening in to the previous session also a little bit and as also a part time educator i can totally confirm what many of the panelists say that for me education is also a way to to educate is also a way to educate myself as a as a pr practitioner so that's uh, incredibly important uh, uh, for me as well i'm going to share my screen uh, uh, very fast uh, uh, with you today and um, <clears throat> i hope uh, it's uh, all right now can you see me please moderator can you confirm <laughs> Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, this. that's great. So then I can uh, continue. Uh, uh, indeed, well, uh, uh, the, the theme of the summit uh, is, is a very holistic one, and we're already uh, entering metaverse uh, soon, or, or bringing it back to, to the universe, indeed. And I was thinking, well, there's so many themes of, of this summit that also uh, are important for our work uh, at NVRDV. So why not try to be uh, very uh, inclusive in my presentation as well? So therefore, I chose the topic of, uh, of data density and diversity as some of the main uh, drivers of our uh, designs in, uh, well, in many places, actually. We are an office uh, that started in Rotterdam. And in the meantime, we've opened offices in other cities as well, like Shanghai, Paris, Berlin. As you can see here, and our very colorful uh, Rotterdam core offices are today also the background <laughs> of my uh, of my Zoom uh, screen. So first, the, the, the three uh, the three uh, uh, D's, the, the triple D's for my uh, for my uh, intro, uh, for my title: data. Why is data so important uh, for architecture? Well, obviously, uh, image I often show it's everywhere. It's in everything we are using it. It's also partly using us. Uh, so we have to be critical about it uh, as well. But whatever happens, it's part of our life. Also, uh, a wonderful uh, image I often use. 
it is also in our uh, construction world already very much. And uh, to the right of this image, you see future-proof design and construction, designing with materials and methods of the future. It's an important aspect of that. So as a designer, I'd like to talk about that as well today. But we are, of course, fully aware that we are in a data-driven world already. And hopefully it helps to improve our, uh, our construction world because I must say, uh, it's a conservative world and it is often lagging behind. It's hard to change. Uh, it's hard to change uh, standard ways of working. Now, our office started 28 years ago and from the first moment on, uh, thinking about information and incorporating it into our designs has been a very important aspect for us. It's a, maybe a wish for this pragmatism also that I think Martha was talking about. Let's be honest and be truthful to all the information we are using as designers to include and to make our designs uh, better. And of course, we are really in it nowadays. This is just a screen uh, of showing all the, for example, scripting tools that we use in our office uh, as well. And it needs permanent education of our employees, as I also heard was an important theme before, also inside our office. Uh, because none of us, I wasn't even uh, in my uh, student years uh, using the computer, only in the very last moment it popped up. And there's many generations of older architects that haven't even been introduced to it. And nowadays we have generations where, well, I guess even a toddlers already have, uh, have screens in their hands uh, today. So it's a, it's a really rapid paradigm shift we are dealing with, but it gives us wonderful opportunities as well. The second D of density. Why do we have to think about density? Well, the Netherlands is a densifying country. That's probably how it started. But we know, of course, that the majority of the world's population is nowadays living in cities. And how can we make our life, lives ag agreeable and nice? And uh, yeah, cities are, uh, are maybe only uh, occupying 2% of the total land. However, uh, they are very, yeah, they're producing our wealth. That's, that's good, one could say. Uh, it's a sustainable way of, uh, of using our land. Uh, uh, they also uh, consume, of course, a lot of energy. Now the things are not getting as blue and green anymore. Uh, cities also produce a lot of waste. Uh, building industry is producing a lot of waste. And uh, yeah, the Glasgow sim summit has just ended. Uh, cities, uh, but also the, the construction industry is unfortunately producing a lot of greenhouse gas emission. And we as designers can play a role in, in limiting that uh, to a large extent. So there is our responsibility. But also, um, yeah, uh, when we think about cities, they, they are growing, they are sprawling. Uh, we have to think about, of course, how we can make life better for those who are living in, in cities. Huh? And not just be planners and how, how are we going to uh, build uh, 20 20,000, 30,000 million homes uh, more, but how can we make sure that people live in a nice way in these uh, in places as well? And we need governments to support that as well, as uh, uh, the UN Habitat Director also said at this conference. I always show this image uh, in my lectures. So that means we have to think inclusive about our designs. Eh? We shouldn't limit ourselves just to four walls and a roof. We should think about materialization, about energy, about maybe creating cycles. Uh, so as, a, as imagineers of the future in 2000, we built this then still hypothetical pavilion at the World Expo, which nowadays already uh, looks a bit out of, out of, uh, out of time in a, in a funny way, because a lot of things we did there that seem to be spectacular are nowadays common practice eh, with high green on buildings and energy producing uh, buildings. The, the third D is diversity that I want to show in my uh, in my little lecture, and diversity is is also for me personally an incredible important uh, topic. We are all humans. Uh, we all have our our needs, common needs, individual needs. We need to uh, think about the needs of those who can't speak for themselves. And I'm very happy that, for example, my office. This is just a, sh a small selection of images, includes a little bit uh, the world, uh, although. Most of them are architects, so yes, no, 
uh, in any case, they are from very different nationalities and backgrounds and genders. So that's where we can begin yeah, to see if our offices, our uh, architects offices are representative for, uh, for society as a whole. And then only then we can reach, of course, the incredible diverse uh, uh, ambitions that uh, this 17 uh, sustainable development goals also express so well. Huh? This is things that we all have to deal with, which are all part also of our built environment. So as architects, we can be part of imagining that future. And uh, to change the future, you have to begin yourself with your own practice, of course. So diverse, thinking about the diversity of the community that will inhabit our projects is uh, is very important for us. This is a this is a project from a longer time already ago, but you can see here express the different types of people with different incomes uh, living together here in Amsterdam. Um, also uh, means that you just don't look at the outside of building, but also think about who's living inside of them. This is just a small collection of the interiors. We always like to sneak and peek into our own buildings again after they are finished. Um, it was already mentioned before also in the panel, uh, starting uh, my lecture, I would like to talk about communities. And I have four different groups of projects that I want to show you today to illustrate our thoughts. And we are, as MVRDV, we're not just architects, we're also planners, uh, urbanists. And I'm gonna yeah, move through some of our projects uh, always uh, with the data, diversity, density topic uh, in the back of our minds. Uh, I think a very important topic today is, of course, resiliency. And we were very happy to be part of a manifest uh, of, a, of a manifestation or, or organization project for the San Francisco Bay Area, together with this uh, incredible uh, team of landscape architects, urbanists, uh, traffic consultants, uh, and, and many more. Uh, digital people and uh, it's important because there actually we came up with uh, the idea for the Bay Area community to um, to maybe create uh, a catalog of possibilities of which the community uh, around the Bay Area where San Francisco is part of could make their own uh, selections um, of, uh, of facilities and uh, what was the what was the goal of it? Um, actually, the Bay Area is suffering from many uh, disaster prone stuff. Eh? We, we know, of course, there can be earthquakes there, but there's also <coughs> threat of sea level rising. There's, um, there's also sometimes too much water coming from, uh, from rainfall. They have fires. Uh, and the idea was to develop a catalog of, uh, of facilities because there's also poverty in the, uh, in the area as well. And uh, San Francisco is now one of the most expensive cities in the world, but there's also therefore a lot of commuting to cheaper areas and from cheaper areas uh, in the Bay. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's all quite vulnerable. It's just this one highway around the Bay that you can see here. And our idea was let's make more connections and let these connections be made together with the population of the different communities living around the uh, Bay Area. And at the same time, these, uh, these new connections could help to make the whole area more resilient, resilient against climate change, against poverty, and all these kind of, uh, kind of things. So basically, we wanted to devise a, a network of connectors and collectors. Uh, connectors between people, more um, a different modes of transport yeah, to not to just be relying on the car and the one highway when there's one crack in this highway nobody can get anywhere anymore uh, but also collectors to collect the uh, the water uh, uh, and move it downwards uh, in a better way but also maybe together they form a way to escape maybe to the water in in times of uh, disaster and all these new connections could also be exactly those points where we could make new community facilities. Facilities that through this communication with the population, we could select together. And so uh, you can see that uh, the whole system of, uh, of water collection, uh, connecting of people uh, could, could handle uh, and deal and uh, make a, a whole area more resilient against uh, disaster and uh, climate change. Um, 
So altogether, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, as designers, we are designing then a system, a, a, syst a systemic way of thinking, uh, learning, in, in fact, from, uh, from digital networks, of course, to make sure that there are much more shortcuts and, and ways out of uh, and in of the system. And at the same time, offer, uh, offer possibilities for community, communities to intervene and to select their own uh, facilities around these uh, new networks. And this is really huge scale uh, design. So here you see some of those uh, communities around, uh, around the city of, uh, of San Francisco. Mm, another thing with uh, communities and, and, uh, and, and diversity and, and the digital, we've experienced in the past year when we were invited to make a master plan for this area in, uh, in Kansas City. Uh, we were invited by the Office of Port, who have a wonderful track record in, in very uh, yeah, interactive uh, design, uh, community-based design uh, uh, processes. And they, uh, they, they invited us, but it was also uh, during all kinds of lockdowns, we were not able to travel. And there, uh, but also there locally, the people weren't allowed to meet up uh, a lot of the time. And I, I show this project because I think in the previous one, the resiliency against disaster and water and flooding is something which is a global problem. Uh, and the same is for this area called Armadale in Kansas, uh, which is completely surrounded by industry. Uh, has a problem with, with poverty and, and negligence. And that's also something we find worldwide uh, for cities today. And there's also, again, the risk of flooding. You can see this big river uh, surrounding it. So it was once developed as a, as a nice kind of worker area for the factories uh, to make sure that the laborers uh, had, uh, and the men and the managers had a, had a home. But, uh, but it turned out to become a very isolated place and the industry uh, became much more important. And uh, yeah, the people were more or less left behind. Even um, their relationship with the river was completely uh, neglected. So this is all sort of the diagram of what was, uh, what was happening there. And you can imagine maybe that it led to extreme uh, difficulties as well. So how to deal with this? Eh? So the neighborhood that is sort of completely enclosed and bordered and almost strangled by the industrial complex, uh, leading to a lot of poverty. And on, on the other hand, a community with a very strong identity and still a strong cohesiveness also that you can make use of when you work in the uh, area. And uh, yeah, what can we uh, uh, add as designers to this, uh, to this, to this issue? So we uh, investigated actually what are all the issues that have to be deal dealt with and have to be solved in some way. Uh, and can we help to stimulate it by organization of space, but also empowering people to, uh, to get out of this, uh, yeah, out of this deadlock, deadlock, uh, deadlock situation there. Um, and the most important is, of course, talking with the community. So it's also something that we somehow in education, I think, have to have to make sure that it also finds a place yeah, to be to to engage yourself, to to talk to people on site, to to get to know the people you're working for and with. And in this case, uh, it was done for many different channels with outreach teams on site, with surveys, websites, uh, workshops, talking to community leaders. Uh, interviewing people, making them fill out all kinds of forms that were, uh, that were given uh, and spread in the community. And we also organized all different kinds of workshops uh, about yeah, public health and safety. This is about how, how, the, how, the, how the public sector, eh, how, the, how the government is still present in an area or not. Economic, economics with the local uh, with the local entrepreneurs, but also with different groups of young uh, uh, families, uh, yeah, aging people, different focus groups. And we used wonderful techniques like Miro boards uh, to have uh, online workshops uh, as well. And sometimes there were markets where people from ports could go to, but we also did it online in small groups, gathering information, talking together, trying to visualize their problems. Uh, as well for them and in using uh, colorful diagrams and, uh, and photographs and, and all kinds of modes of uh, communication. And the things and the conclusions 
I think in many places are important. Reconnect, don't forget us, reprogram, empower us. Uh, what's going on in this area? We need more clarity from the government. We need more interaction. We need green, of course, and safety, public space, community cohesion. How can you do that in a design? And uh, what is very interesting, I think, is uh, we come from an age where uh, we have uh, divided all functions in cities a lot, huh? industry on one hand, uh, living on the other. Uh, but maybe it's time also to think again about productive cities and make interaction between work, between work and, um, and living uh, 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 important again, huh? because we can be productive in producing uh, uh, our own green and our own, uh, think about, take care of our own green in the community, like on the left, huh? on a smaller scale, help to build our own homes and empower people to do, to do so by uh, uh, giving simple structures. Um, we can also help people to develop, yeah, to have this kind of, uh, um, yeah, workshop-like situations in neighborhoods as well, to let uh, to educate uh, people and uh, and learn jobs and uh, the big stuff. Yeah, we can use it as well, maybe for energy, for example, raising energy on these big factory halls there and uh, using the floodplains for recreation, because they're not always flooded. And yeah, identifying the voids literally in the community. We need public spaces. Uh, we need to rebuild on important spots in a community like this. We have to identify that and make sure that people not just make new buildings, but also new public spaces. Uh, and when you create uh, housing projects, that there's also places to meet uh, in front of that. Uh, and this is a wonderful uh, example that Port uh, uh, came with. So from, from segregation to integration and creating industry, yeah, like a, like, a, like a thriving buffer zone, uh, this dark yellow around the community where actually uh, labor and living interact again, make bridges and connections, invest in public space. Indeed, also the connectors and collectors in the circles on the waterfront, include the waterfront in the community. It can be used most of the time as a, as a wonderful park and then suddenly something which is like a backside becomes almost like a front side of a, uh, of a city again. But this is something which, which works on so many different interactive levels with so many different specialists working together. Can't even begin to visualize it. I guess the best visualization will be in some years when the community uh, yeah, starts to, to become a uh, function uh, better again. Moving on to dwelling, another scale is um, also something I'd like to show to you because that's also an important uh, 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 place where our growing world population, data-driven design, and um, yeah, and density come together, of course. So data-driven design for us also means that we are more and more able as designers to include important elements of our daily life, uh, not just through consultancy, but also in our own design process. Uh, as part of uh, yeah, how we create and densify neighborhoods for, for a project in for many of our projects, and I'm going to show one, for example, now in in, uh, in France. Eh? It's in uh, Bordeaux, Ilo Uh We worked, for example, with the data that you need uh, to optimize densification. Eh? Uh, in many cities, we have, of course, the importance of dealing with sun and light in the street, and at the same time. We're upping our programs more and more. Well, maybe this is, you could also uh, use it in a different way because I think in some areas of the world, we also need shading, of course, and not just nonstop sun. So this is an interesting parameter that should be very localized uh, when it's uh, in use. But you can see how we, uh, through different techniques in our offerings and applying different data sets, uh, start, to, start to shape our, our environment eh? with sun hours, with sun spots, with uh, yeah aims and goals, how to deal with sun and and how how to create buildings that better cater that. So on a practical level, for example, we did it on this large site in Bordeaux. Our office made a master plan for this former uh, railroad yard with factories and some housing as well. And then you see how the different layers of data. We're now putting in, uh, well, it's the original French presentation. See how we can start to build buildings on the former tracks, 
uh, we, uh, we take out uh, spaces to also have public spaces. We reconnect it to the streets and the context. Uh, then we uh, just start with a kind of massing, as if we start to create a model, yeah, our, rough, uh, our rough blocks are, uh, are put on. And then we uh, start to cut it, carve it out to get enough light on the, on the streets, yeah, on all the buildable areas. Of course, there's uh, existing buildings included. Uh, we uh, even uh, put on minimum daylight uh, measurements. We contextualize to get views and context to include the existing buildings uh, as well and give way to uh, specificities. 144 architects will be invited to create a really colorful, uh, diverse uh, scheme to fit into the master plan. And, uh, and of course, we don't make massive buildings, but we're also opening it up for air and light uh, inside uh, as well. And we are, we'll add a lot of, uh, of solar panels and some uh, other, other ways of making natural, uh, uh, en uh, creating energy and green roofs also can be an important aspect uh, of the designs uh, as well. Not to mention underground, the water collection as well. So that leads to sort of, um, yeah, uh, manipulations of massing and uh, careful studies of all kinds of these aspects in the sections. But it also leads to actually new data-driven design of architecture. Uh, so you see huh, to the right uh, in this image is still this classical way of making setbacks to get light into, uh, into the streets. But we now can uh, build even much more by, yeah, by creating this sort of iceberg-like uh, volumes, uh, which leads also to all kinds of nice uh, different apartments in the uh, complex. Uh, and, and you get sections like these. Get rid of the cars, important always, but also make sure there's enough cover on the car parks to have, uh, have green uh, courtyards uh, uh, as well. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there are, for example, in this block of which we are uh, uh, also the architects, uh, there are different types of apartments, including almost half of them affordable housing. Um, uh, there's a parking, a shop, and a rooftop restaurant uh, as well in the glass uh, parts. Uh, we're opening up the blocks. Uh, you start to see the diversity, but you don't start to see who paid what for his house and in what financial structure. So that's also very, uh, very important. And we make a lot of collective spaces as well. Huh? So some of the entrances and gates become playgrounds and covered meeting spaces uh, in the project uh, as well. So data diversity, density coming together. Uh, and uh, in another project in, uh, in another city in France, Rennes, the, the, the capital of Br Brittany, uh, some of the same uh, measurements, huh? uh, densification, but at the same time allowing views through and across the project, making as much as possible outdoor spaces here and balconies and green. Uh, again, a mixture of different financial categories from social to mid-income and regular. Uh, expressive shaping that leads to a very big diversity of floor plans and layouts and different types of uh, amounts of bedrooms from one bedroom to five bedrooms, for example. I'm not going to go through all these steps in the design, but again, this sort of shaping with information is an important aspect of how we create these, uh, these buildings. They're also wrapped around an existing little hole on this canal. It's uh, close to the downtown of Rennes, a historical place. Uh, and here you see how, how actually everybody in the project will have a wonderful view, have a balcony, no front or back rows here in this, uh, in this project. And again, this permeability with collective open void spaces which always allow a fantastic place also to meet, to organize a neighborhood or a block party uh, or, or meeting as well. Huh? So it's just void spaces, but they allow, uh, and it's under construction right now, as you can see, uh, a nice a public waterfront, of course, it's not privatized here. Uh, allow for little places to meet in your uh, project. Moving to a different uh, continent in the States, a project for, uh, the San Francisco Giants, their parking lot being converted uh, with different architects. Here it is actually a couple of months ago. It's already much further uh, ahead in the same Bay uh, 
uh, area, indeed a flood park in front of it uh, now to prevent it from being flooded. Four architects, uh, studio gang coordinating, Henning Larsen, work accolade and us with the, with the reddish building in the front tower. Uh, but we opened it up, we carved it out. There's offices in it as well in the plinth and retail, but also uh, in, at the heart and at the roofs, places to meet uh, and to talk to each other. Again, with different uh, floor, uh, floor plan types for different types of people, also affordable. This is very important for the San Francisco Giants. They say all our fans should be able to live in this complex. So it's really something that the client should also take care of eh? and, uh, and include in the, in the programming. Uh, so this one's under construction. I'm not going to talk about it too long. But it's also very mixed eh, with, uh, with a plinth of retail, some offices living all together in a, in a quarter. And yes, we also made a project in India. We made several projects in India, uh, a lot of them about public space. But this one is for housing in Pune. Mm, this is the, uh, the building. There will be some more, I think, in the future. As you can see, quite a particular uh, uh, organization. And... Uh, the original master plan asked for a couple of towers, which we thought was pretty isolated way of, uh, of living. So we devised a way whereby we could create a bit more, even with tall buildings, a sense of community in the, uh, in the area. And we also talked with the client about, again, the mixture. And uh, I think the different colors represent the size of the apartment. And we started to negotiate it. And the marketing team of the project also helped to diversify and mix and mingle, because I think if you mix and mingle different uh, housing sizes, you also get different kind of people in your uh, in your buildings. And so here are eight eight uh, apartments, but they're all very different in size. So you can imagine that different types of people, like singles and couples and families and extended families, would be all living in this uh, in this particular part of the building, for example. And you also notice, of course, it's put on top of a par car park. There's some some half uh, enclosed plazas and facilities, but there are also these openings in the project, these sort of collective living rooms, because if we make a building so large, it doesn't really help just to make a couple of openings on the lower levels. We really wanted to integrate them as well on the higher level. So you will be able to meet some of the people from your uh, uh, surroundings and area in, in particular places, which also have different functions, like like collective living rooms uh, in the uh, in the project, including of course some playgrounds, some places to meet and talk, and also again at the at the, at the lower levels, uh, there's some nice uh, outdoor design here, but there's also covered spaces like this one uh, here, uh, where you can see a class moving towards the, the playgrounds. Uh, yeah, just a place to sit and meet and, and hang around in the shade, uh, of course. Uh, as well. Uh, so you can see here how the different, how this building uh, is, uh, yeah, we have, uh, everybody has uh, balconies uh, as well. Things we try to get in every project all around the world. I'm continuing. I'm a bit uh, behind schedule. So uh, uh, somebody should give me a bit of a sign on, on the on the app, uh, how much time I still have left. I just keep on talking. <laughs> no, no, Miss Natalie, I'll, I'll do that. Please continue. Okay, thanks. Well, I'm uh, to the, in the third part. <laughs> I think we also have to talk about work in another way. Huh? We had in Armadale, of course, already uh, the industrial, uh, the, the, let's say, re-industrialization, bringing work in a nicer way uh, back into the community, uh, having workplaces for everyone. Uh, many of us are also office workers, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, so much has changed also in the way we are thinking about work. It has been in the past, but it has even been accelerated in the past two years. Uh, we were very happy to make this uh, building uh, to the right called Werk, Werk 12, which is like an office workers club in a way. Office workers club, you could say, to liven a neighborhood near a station in Munich, where there will be a lot of offices built, but also a lot of housing built. But you also need to to uh, relax and enjoy and, uh, well, uh, have, have, have offices in, an, in a different context. Eh? And this building tries to cater for that. You can see a very open structure that we designed, an open way of building. We think that's one of the most sustainable way of building in the future. 
where we can incorporate many different types of functions, uh, including offices, events, spaces. And we even uh, know, of course, there will be different floor to ceiling heights there. So we suggest sometimes to take this double height as a point of departure and put other functions in more as infills that you can remove, and that you have different lifespans in the construction of a building. This is really the open building system. And it can still be very fun. Huh? So it looks, it's, it's kind of rough and ready in a way, but it can also be a lot of fun if what's happening inside is really showing off uh, and buzzing uh, on the outside. This is a building with even multiple points of entry. So yeah, so these are the infills I was talking about, almost like pieces of furniture uh, for functions that need some closing off in the bigger, uh, in the bigger spaces. We have uh, a point of entry, which is kind of a gallery, but there's also the escape routes are also alternative uh, entry points so that you can really access the building from all kinds of different uh, 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 sites. Well, and the sports inside, like I said, offices, swimming pool, restaurants. So it's a really neutral floor plan with columns and these galleries. And each floor, like the ground floor, of course, there's two floors because there's the basic floor and the infill uh, on top of it. All with the idea that it can also be flexible again uh, at some point. And just continuing, we even managed to include a swimming pool in the in the equation. And of course, uh, yeah, it is also an attractive building where maybe the people who will be living and working in the area will will meet eh, and come and, and are coming together to also offer a space for the nicer things uh, and the relaxing things of uh, of life. It's like a, like a kind of commercial community center, one could say. You've of course been noticing all these uh, letters. It's part of our original competition uh, uh, design. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, two uh, artists, Engelman and Engel, uh, said, well, it reminds us of actually what you see in, uh, in Donald Duck. <laughs> You sort of, ooh, uh, uh, noises that are sometimes made. And uh, why not include that uh, on the facade? Because it's like a universal language. And it's really, uh, yeah, it's really wonderful to have that now uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our design. And, and we collaborate a lot with artists because we think, on the one hand, we try to be very basic and, and neutral and transformable in our designs, but we also need joy and, and fun in our lives. And, and often the artists and designers that we collaborate with and the colorful uh, uh, and, and the use of color, a very simple and a very cheap way of making life more nice uh, are part of our, uh, our designs. Uh, so second working building I'd like to show you is this one, which uh, starts in Wroclaw in Poland. Uh, on an island where uh, the, the Nazis in the Second World War uh, re retreated and used it as a kind of bastion. So everything was broken down and shut down and, and yes, just ruins left in the middle of the city for a long, long time until we were asked to deal with this one of the last remaining fragments of a building, which by the way, contained fantastic uh, uh, um, uh, street art uh, uh, at the same time. And uh, adding to that uh, a commercial program of uh, collective co-working spaces, restaurants, and meeting places. Uh, and at the same time, make it, uh, it's, uh, yeah, giving sort of um, acknowledge the fact that it's also really a central meeting place in the city as well. So not closing it off. I mean, in, in, in a way, an office is a, is a closed uh, shop no? for, uh, for those who are not working there. But in this case, uh, all the pink areas are, are retail, are, are, are cafes and, and meeting spaces where there will always be people entering. And we did that on, on yeah, on both sides, the, the new and the old part of the building. You see a bit on the roof here, how we opened that up. Uh, at the bottom, uh, a new hall where you see the old and the new, uh, yeah, this is, this is an event space. And on the other hand, our new part uh, with, uh, with fantastic uh, rooftop uh, cafe, green roof, um, and uh, and a wonderful space to uh, to to eat and drink. Yeah, co-working offices very important. I think nowadays many of us are freelancing or working alone, but we also like to meet again. So the whole co-working is becoming ever more important in the in the city, yeah? uh, and, and finding places for that. 
but also uh, yeah, a social place. Eh? So you work there, you drink a coffee together, uh, and you meet not just indoor, but outdoor as well. Here you see a bit the island uh, situation. And at night, actually, the youth takes over of Wroclaw. Uh, so at daytime, people work there. At the nighttime, people have a lot of fun there as well. And you might have noticed again, here's an artist, Alicia Biala, a young artist from Poland, who made incredible fresco-like uh, paintings, uh, partly incorporating the history of Wroclaw, but also imaginary animals and uh, yeah, the river and all these kind of things inspired her. And she, she painted it by herself in an incredible <laughs> way, uh, which is really the lively heart of the building. And I also like to emphasize, and because of diversity, here she is sitting again on the left, Alicia, but next to her, my, my partner and project leader, uh, Fokke Morel, uh, that's me. Then you have the mayor, and then you have our client, Eva Völkel, who came up with the whole concept of this building uh, as well, together with us. Uh, an all-female uh, building team there from uh, client and designer part. That's wonderful. And the presenter was a guy again. Uh, and isn't it often the other way around? Uh, uh, so it was incredible fun to work on it like that as well. Mm, yeah, oh yeah, a third office building in Colombo. I thought I have to show you this as well. We worked in Sri Lanka on a new office building uh, in, a, in an area that's rapidly transforming. There's still some of the old remains, a factory owned by the family uh, of our clients that transformed it partly in this nice uh, area to go out as well. But there's also all these towers popping up in the city uh, uh, at the same time. And um, so what we did is we tried to connect with our scheme, uh, this, um, yeah, these alleyways with the new uh, nice activities to our, the new building we also put on site, but also save space as much as possible because of, yeah, now there's still a lot of green, and we thought in our site, we have to find spaces for that as well, again. And we had an interesting discussion. It's hot <laughs> in Colombo, but I've also liked including daylight and, uh, and, um, and fresh air uh, a lot and opening windows in offices. And there's also was the issue of car park. So client helped us to make sure that we could shrink the building so that we still have some public space. We made some nice, a nice plaza here in front. But we also incorporated, that's what you see, whirling around this building. Uh, oh, here we have the groundbreaking with at the right, the Mater Familias, who was an important uh, critic during the whole process. I mean, nothing would go ahead if she wouldn't agree to uh, what, we are, uh, what we were doing. Uh, managed to get in, um, well, we incorporated this plaza on the right in front, but also uh, big trees uh, all around the site and not completely filled up with building. Uh, the client introduced a rooftop uh, uh, as well. And on the first levels, we have some car park also on the ground. But we designed it in such a way that it also can be converted to offices once the car is less, uh, less in use. In, uh, yeah, so the floor to ceiling height is, is higher. Uh, currently, we, we green it, but it's all ready for uh, transformation. And then you see, of course, this uh, closer and, and opener uh, parts of uh, the building. Oh, yeah, you see the, the ground floor uh, and, the, and the greenery that we added. And it's, again, a lot of artists and architects uh, inside involved, making these wonderful artworks and uh, interiors. Here you see the office floor currently used as car park. That's how I would like to label it, of course, and the provisions for the green. And each office this is the rough, uh, uh, unfinished version with a lot of opportunities to still also open and to create maybe verandas, uh, uh, to not to be totally reliant on, uh, on air conditioning uh, every hour uh, of the day. And indeed, outdoor facilities as well, eh, which could also be this sort of co-working space again uh, uh, that we have, and a building that also communicates at night, of course, and is lively uh, for the neighborhood uh, as well. Right. And some other images from the context. I'm moving on to the last buildings again. I'm just continuing until somebody stops me. Um, Natalie, there are actually there are uh, there are a question or two. 
from ah, the okay. audience. So probably you can wind up in another five minutes and then Parth will post the questions to you. Okay, then I will do that. Yeah. Okay. Last but not least, I'm going to talk about some public projects. Uh, one in Seoul, where uh, in the in the really in the heart of the city, across the tracks, but also highways, a piece of highway was actually taken out by the city, uh, and uh, and said we're going to just take that out and transform that from a car infested place to a place where uh, people can bridge this incredible gutter of infrastructure. And uh, my colleague Winnie uh, de designed this whole. Uh, a wonderful park on top of it, which acts like a sort of nursery for plants in the city. A nursery of plants, and when they have grown enough, they will be put in other places uh, in the city. It's like a catalog of local, local vegetation. And uh, there's all kinds of pavilions, and the, and the design was basically uh, the, the park and all the elements to get up and about and around this uh, place. And it has, like, of course, it's 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 big big ancestor, the uh, the High Line, an incredible, uh, powerful impact on all the real estate uh, in the surroundings. Uh, but also, you suddenly see that people are living there actually <laughs> in that area, and they're not in their cars, they're not uh, shoved aside on the streets, but they're taking over uh, in a wonderful uh, in a wonderful way. And uh, through these new connections, this whole area is sort of revitalized eh? from just being offices and shops and people living on the outside of this, uh, they are back in the, in the center of, uh, of attention. Of course, the green is fantastic as well, adding shade and, and, and better conditions for living in the middle, uh, in the heart of a, of, a, of a huge city and with water uh, as well, and also safe at night and, uh, and accessible as well. And uh, the French uh, had this saying in the 60s that Sule, to the uh, uh, well under the pavement uh, is the is the is the beach yeah? under the pavement is the beach when the revolution started but under these pavements are actually uh, <laughs> we we actually moved it around now no the the beach is is uh, floating above above the streets <laughs> it's in the sky <laughs> and uh, again uh, community building is, is, is incredibly important. Eh? So I was talking about mixing people, different types of people in buildings. Uh, and in this community in Denmark, in Copenhagen, the community said, well, we're going to densify. There will be lots of new people living here, but there's also people from, from the really old neighborhood and from the 70s, and there's all kinds of yeah, there's workers. Let's build a community center right in the middle of that. And this is the community center and a park. And there's a car park underneath. And in this community center, uh, it's all dedicated to health, to healthy living for your mind and your body. There's different kinds of programs inside. There's a, there's a bit of a startup place. There's a kitchen, communal kitchen and cafe. You can play there. It's very dark in Copenhagen uh, already at four o'clock in the winter. So children can go inside. People can meet. You can have yoga classes. You can move. It's also important. Climb, have fun. So all the people in this community from different backgrounds will be meeting each other inside and outside with a small amphitheater as well. So the building is really interactive, one could say. Exciting, uh, promoting also healthy food and, and movement is important eh? because so many people have issues nowadays with their weight uh, and with moving uh, uh, not enough. This is just on a Saturday. On a weeknight and Tuesdays, it looks, of course, completely different when people come in for classes and yoga and whatever. Uh, and it really acts again as a kind of central meeting point with markets and, well, fun. Mm, last building, <laughs> the depot. It opened last week. Uh, hybrid building, actually, hybrid public building. We have a wonderful museum in Rotterdam. Uh, uh, you can see it here above in the uh, drawing and the long thing is the architecture archive. And next to it is a park, but the uh, museum had a big problem. All their Rembrandts and Van Goghs and Salvador Dalis were in the basement. Uh, we're flooding all the time. We have also climate change problem, rain, uh, groundwater coming up. So like a billion euro uh, crisis there, and uh, with the help of the, the uh, public sector and private collectors, a new archive building had to be made, but it 
museum director had a wonderful idea to turn it into a archive you can actually visit and use. And we also introduced a rooftop, accessible rooftop to it as well. So in the basis is of course a very close buildings with archival spaces that have to be very safe and climate uh, proof uh, so that the art is uh, protected. But we also opened up the heart for a wonderful Wunderkammer place of miracles. Here you see the whole thing on the construction, heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. Not gonna go into that. Opened last week, Fridays, eight days ago, by our king. There he is, looking up at himself maybe, because the whole building has a mirrored facade to mirror, to mirror the city, to mirror the park. So it has to, it's a very big, fat building, but, but because it's mirroring, it also sort of absorbs and opens and is almost away. Uh, uh, also, again, dreaming, entering through doors that open like a James Bond movie, like, phew, to both sides. Uh, and then you enter into an artwork already, go up a little bit, and then you look up, and then there's this sort of Pyrenean uh, feeling there with partly glass floors and lots of objects from the, from the depots, exposed and ever-changing. You can walk or wander around. Uh, you see temporary exhibitions, people can uh, show and uh, collectors are also putting their art in there. Um, but you also look into the depots, actually. That's amazing. No? You see suddenly the enormous treasures uh, in the museum. And when you put on a white coat and get in a tour, you can actually uh, be taken into the archive and see what's going on there and get explanation from the people in the museum that are maybe restoring the art. And you can have a look at that as well. And you just see the Rembrandt and I don't know what, like the billions of euros hanging there, but also seeing it. There's areas for events as well. There's a nice restaurant on top. And every evening after five o'clock, everybody can go into the building for free to visit the rooftop. Um, and enjoy the views over Rotterdam. And of course, there are trees there, trees that are specially grown to survive here on the high level. Again, uh, with the mirror effect to even amplify this feeling. And uh, there's a nice new artwork on the outside, also making use of the reflections by Pipilotti Risk, also all started last week. Wonderful projections. And to end the circle, the full circle maybe is also what was opening is an exhibition about our own archive. Uh, first uh, 400 project numbers are stored in the, in the architectural archive next to the depot actually also, the Architecture and Design Museum Institute. Uh, they are looking at our work because we are one of the first born digital offices and they wanna know how to archive that and how it influenced our design. So in the design, you can make, uh, you can sneak peek into our into the archive boxes. Our models are dusted off, but there's also conversations with the archivists and curators present. You can see sketches and details uh, of our designs, early models, and uh, yeah, also talking about uh, things like I was talking about to you in uh, in my lecture today. But also the, the old data archives are used for some new interactive installations. So you can basically design your own MRDV project now, uh, <laughs> like, like we are using our own digital past as well in our, uh, in our, own, uh, in our own work. So, and all this inter, inter, interweaving of, of drawing and model making and conversations and data driven here at the front, that's what I might, will be my last image now, uh, is our very first project we ever did together. Uh, in front of this high rise with a lot of diversity <laughs> inside with a lot of diagrams we made. So uh, yeah, back to where I be began uh, this morning actually. And thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you very much for this lovely presentation. Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed looking at some of your projects, especially the one from Pune. I would probably like to go there and visit sometime. And if they stop me at security, I'll say I know that, Lee. So please allow me. So thank yeah. you so much.
And uh, we've got a couple of questions here because we've got so many students also present. One of the student is asking you uh, if someone wants to probably work at uh, your uh, studio, what, what do you look for in a profile? Uh, and <laughs> how, how can oh, they work? Of course, we are using uh, the internet for that and our website. So if, if this person goes to our website, he will find a way for uh, interns, how to apply and what we ask uh, of you to do so for anyone who is uh, is looking for job opportunities or internships you can just follow a couple of steps lovely lovely so that was wonderful and uh, i mean there were so many comments flowing in uh, that i think i'm lost in the barrage of comments but the one thing that stood out was uh, the lovely uh, you know lovely architecture that you showed because uh, in, there are so many monotonous buildings that we see sometimes, which are just even and 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 boring. But you showed some mix and match, and so so many different diversities that the, that I really enjoyed. And I hope people can take a leaf out of that and replicate that in their own areas. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I'm just going to move on. And Apurva, if you are, you can you want to come in, uh, you can please uh, say your comments if you have. Apurva, are you here? Yeah, I'm very much here. Okay, Natalie, it was wonderful um, to see see your works, and as part um, uh, part also elaborated. Um, yeah, it's it um, probably when I'm in Pune, I'll also love to go and uh, visit the project. Okay, so I also wanted to check since um, you know the theme of our summit is designing the new world order, and we have focused on the themes of uh, society, edu education, technology, inclusivity, and diversity. And um, these are all, all aspects which uh, you are closely associated with. So I'm very keen to know, um, how do you see these aspects transforming in this new world order that we are talking about? Uh, well, I think um, in our office from the beginning, we were very much interested in, in the social aspects of our building. So I think this is something that you can always include very well in, in every design, as you can see, we even negotiate these spaces to meet and to, in, uh, uh, to uh, diversify our programs in projects that we make for commercial clients. Eh? So not just for governments or, or institutions. But that's, a, let's say, a personal responsibility that architects and designers uh, can take. Uh, but we also notice now that there's really a paradigm shift going on in construction. Eh? I cannot simply go on building the way I've been taught to build. This is not, not a sustainable uh, way of, of continuation. So we are really in the process of transforming ourselves as an office also into more, be, be more critical in how we make our designs. So we use, of course, uh, the help of, of, of data and, uh, and scripting and all kinds of tools to, to be more sophisticated in, in, in dealing with the context, uh, for example and the positioning of buildings, but it's also about materiality. So at the moment, one of the teams in my office, we have, a, we have a, like, a, like an investigative uh, research team and we merged actually the data specialist with the sustainable specialist and they are developing something called the Carbonscape, which is uh, monitoring uh, the production of, 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 of green gas as we are designing. Huh? So what are you actually doing here? Like, can we, can we, can we make sure that already during our design, uh, things are, are being improved in a sustainable sense? It's about also about how, what materials you use. It's about thinking even more about future use and trans, uh, transformation of, of buildings. It's using every surface possible, including roofs to be productive. That's what I call now to my, and what I tell my students is multiplicity in design. It's really a multi-layered attitude towards every aspect and element that we uh, touch with our, our designs. Eh? Never, never something just as one meaning. Can it be made productive? Can it be broken, broken down again? Uh, uh, so this is uh, something that maybe the, 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 the current user or owner doesn't even, isn't always aware of, but, but the, the discussion in Colombo with the client, hey, if we make our car, the car park a little higher, we, if we put in the openings already, huh? yeah, maybe it's not the right moment yet to take out the car of this project and it won't be feasible uh, at the moment, but there will be a future in which the car will be gone. And then you can start to use the other part of the building as well for offices. So this is simple things 
that don't even necessarily take so much effort, but which can make uh, buildings, for example, already much more future uh, proof. So Apurva, I'm going to step in and ask Natalie a follow-up question. So are your clients, uh, is the push coming for your clients to do sustainable construction and sustainable design? Or is that coming from your side, Natalie? Anil Vanwari here. Um, I'd like to say that it's, it's a collaboration, but I, I noticed a lot at the moment and with the rising building prices, it's, it's, it's terrible. There's, there's, a, there's, a bit, there's a big problem of uh, the current value of real estate and project and the, and the building costs and uh, sometimes the investments that we have to make. So we have to somehow find a way how to capitalize investments in the future uh, in a better way um, and find ways to design and make buildings that are sometimes uh, cheaper as well. So I think we're still a bit sometimes in a vicious cycle of uh, yeah the short-term uh, return on investment and the long-term vision. But we are very lucky. We can be critical, of course, and we have we start a dialogue with our clients. And I think by now you must have led somewhere, lived somewhere under a stone to not understand that what we are doing right now has an incredible impact on the on the future and on the future generations on our planet. So I see it as a collective responsibility. Yeah, but uh, it's yeah, not an answer. It's not a solution yet. Huh? So it starts with awareness. It starts with what can I do. What can I bring? And we have to have the discussion, like, are we really, do we really want to proceed like this? We're really going ahead with this? And even if this means higher cost, you know, you've got clients as diverse as Colombo to Kansas City. So uh, I'm just concerned that, you know, in Colombo, I thought it would be price would be the uh, deciding factor, lower cost. And we no. know when you're doing sustainability at times, it means higher cost. Uh, no, well, yes and no. Uh, no, well, a little bit higher floor to ceiling height is maybe a little bit more expensive. But I think in the end, what we did added to the value of the building. So maybe huh, it, it has some really nice tenants uh, now as well. So uh, um, no, I think we had a client that was really coming to us and, and say, help me to get uh, a solution for this problem. Huh? There's not an, a limitless amount of money, not at all. But uh, having the dialogue about openable windows, the, the car park uh, uh, issue, the, and, the, and the fact that, the, that, the, um, that the, uh, the owner of the building accepted that we actually made a smaller building than was possible on the plot to add uh, a, a plaza, to add green, uh, I think uh, the client really uh, uh, invested and accepted less revenues. Uh, than, than were possible on the on the site. But in the long term, I think the value of such a building is getting higher than the, than the ones that don't do these things. Now, I'm also going to move on, moving on to another topic. As a woman, uh, you're one of the few women uh, uh, leaders in architecture in the Netherlands. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, there are, there are many, <laughs> but they're not always as visible as, uh, as the male uh, counterparts. But... Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. So for a long time, I, I sort of more or less uh, denied uh, uh, gender. Uh, uh, just we're, we're architects, we're doing our work. But I think uh, I also learned uh, over the long uh, run that uh, it's important. Hey, our office, I think it's always a bit of a, well, it's shifting every now and then. Sometimes there we have more women, sometimes more men. But it's, it's important, again, start with your own workplace. I want to be out there as well to show other women that it's possible uh, to uh, have a place, but we also, I think, it's it's important to to see. It's it's a crazy uh, profession. You, in the in the talk before with the educators, it was also about is it a way of life? You know, it's a way of living, and it can be very absorbing. And in our office and in our profession and in the Netherlands, we had this discussion about for everybody, men and women, the balance of life and work is incredibly important. So as an office, we also have to not push the boundaries too much in that concern. And it's not just for women who are, for some reason or another, always suffering a bit sooner or taking back earlier. Uh, but it's also now the men, the young men that have families and want to be also spending time with them or maybe uh, yeah, have, have a life outside of the office, take care of parents or, or have nice hobbies or whatever. So the work-life balance in a very uh, intense profession like ours is important. And through the female gender issue, we actually came to the point that it's not just 
And I think we have to show our faces. And uh, yeah, it's a bit of a testosterone driven, yeah, the construction industry, not always necessary. I think bringing in other groups and other voices is important because we build for everybody. If you want to build an inclusive society, the ones who are building it and designing it should also be a representation of that same society. What about alternative abilities? Uh, people with uh, some sort of uh, shortfall in, 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 in abilities, it could be uh, paraplegics, it could be blind, it could be visibly impaired. What about uh, those people? Are they getting employment in uh, architectural offices and design firms? Or is that a bit of a challenge? Yes, we have in the, in the Netherlands a very interesting regulation that if you build uh, government projects or if you build in certain cities, you also have to invest in that as well. So that means that part of our, uh, of our fee has to go into uh, employment. We have to prove employment in, in people with, with disabilities, uh, for example. Is, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking it's about. It's like a societal return yeah. that we have to, uh, have to prove. For example, for the depot. And it, it also opened our eyes because uh, we had, uh, we had uh, people entering the office that we didn't have before. And now it's become much more normal. So, uh, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Inclusiveness is, for, uh, is about every, every aspect of life. Okay. That's lovely. Now, thank you so much, Anil, sir. Uh, I have a question to ask. I've got a couple of questions. I know Nia Singh. Yeah, we have a discussion with students as well, eh, I believe. Why yeah. is there a student okay. group lined up? <laughs> Anil, sir, if we could wait, we can take this offline uh, because, and, and you're right, Natalie. Yeah, Natalie, I'll see you in Amsterdam on the, I'm there in Amsterdam on the 30th of this month. Okay, well, hope to, hope to meet you then. Yeah, I think uh, Netherlands and rest of the Scandinavian countries are really setting an example on the equality of opportunity front and inclusivity. So thank you so much, Natalie, for coming here and sharing your views. And definitely students and, and others alike are, are, are really lucky to be hearing you uh, speak about your projects and, and the modalities. Thank you so much.